Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with an enriching top 10 list. You can like it, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any future videos. Today's topic, top 10 watchwords for Christian conversation. Philip Strong wrote the following, The boneless tongue, so small and weak, can crush and kill, declares the Greek. The tongue destroys a greater hoard, the Turk asserts, than does the sword. A Persian proverb wisely saith, A lengthy tongue in early death. Or sometimes takes this form instead, Don't let your tongue cut off your head. From Hebrew wit, this maxim sprung, though feet should slip, ne'er let the tongue. The sacred writer crowns the whole, who keeps his tongue, doth keep his soul. The Bible has a lot to say about the tongue. Here we go with the first helpful hint. A uh, humorous little poem, but I mean, it speaks to the severity of, of our tongues and this idea of conversation. So number one, speech is a precious stewardship for which we will give account. The humans are the only creatures on earth with the ability to speak. And so God considers that a stewardship. And he tells us that we should be purposeful with every word. In other words, think before you speak. Because the scripture says we will give account for every idle word. And the idea is every word to no purpose. Don't waste your words. So it's important that we realize this, that, that my words are a stewardship and God will hold me to account. He has a record of everything I say and I better be careful with my words. Well, yeah, and number two, our speech should be both self-controlled and God-controlled. So James, when he's talking about this, and he has a great little section on the tongue, uses some excellent illustrations. Um, he says, let everyone be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. You know, the reaction against the first point uh, is, okay, then I just won't say anything at all. But James says, no, it's not an anchor we need, it's a rudder. It's not a muzzle we need, it's a bit. So we need control of our speech. We don't want to be silent either because uh, sometimes silence isn't golden, it's just plain yellow. Sometimes we're just uh, uh, not willing to be courageous enough to speak when we should speak. So it's not a matter of saying nothing because that's wasting my stewardship. Nor is it a matter of saying the wrong thing because that's abusing my stewardship. So we need to be slow to speak, but we need to be ready to speak. And so both are true. And there's a helpful little daily prayer uh, the psalmist says in Psalm 141, verse 3, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. So we need a consecrated tongue along with the rest of us that, uh, that the tongue is in the service of the Lord. Number three, realize the heart is the source and secret of the kind of words we speak. So the Lord Jesus, James refers to the perfect man. Someone who can get it right every time with his tongue is a perfect man. Jesus was that person. And he said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. And then he adds, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So David makes this point in the 19th Psalm, and he says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So 
the, the heart is seen as the fountain out of which the words flow. So if I'm concerned about the water in the fountain, so to speak, if I'm more concerned about editing the meditations of my heart, I won't have to be so concerned about the words of my mouth because that's what will come out. Now, there are some people who say, well, I could never get up and speak about the Lord. But every time they open their mouth, it's like a garage, out comes a new car. Or it's like a locker room and out comes a sports figure. Their heart is full of automobiles or full of sports. And so out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Likewise, if I'm constantly gossiping and thinking about people, when I open my mouth, that's what comes out. So I betray myself. The tongue is the index of the soul and it tells what's going on inside. So David says, Lord, help me control the meditations of my heart as well as my speech. If my heart's controlled and what I meditate on is, is something that is honoring to the Lord, then more than likely what comes out of my mouth will match what's in my heart. Number four, we should avoid a critical tone demeaning others. The proverb says, there is one who speaks recklessly like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. So the idea is I can hurt or heal people with my tongue. And the foolish person hurts other people and the wise person heals other people with their tongue. And in the New Testament we read, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. So I can, again, be a stumbling block or a stepping stone to my brothers and sisters. I can encourage them to be elevated, to be, to be raised up in their thinking, in their way of life, or I can put them down. And again, uh, we see fathers and mothers speaking evil to their children, telling their children they're stupid or this or that. No wonder the children come to think of themselves in that way. Now, it's not helpful simply to, to gush about people, you're the, you're the greatest, you're the most wonderful person. That's not what we're talking about, giving them false praise. But to speak the kinds of words the Lord speaks to people and to let them know how valuable they are to him and, and the purpose he has for them to speak words of blessing on people instead of hurting them with words of criticism and harshness. Number five, we should practice honesty and never lie to one another. All right, Ephesians 4.25, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. It's a self-inflicted wound if I lie to other believers. I hurt myself because trust is so important between brothers and sisters. So when I lie, I undermine my own standing. People don't take me seriously when I do speak the truth because I have an inconsistent record and they're not sure whether I'm telling them the truth this time or not. So uh, in the Old Testament, a prophet, if he didn't tell the truth 100% of the time, he was executed because God said, I want people to be able to trust what I say. Well, likewise, among God's people, we need to be able to trust each other. So we should always speak truth with our neighbor. Number six, we should be thankful, relinquishing our right to complain. Everybody has problems, but to inflict all of my problems on somebody else who already has their own problems on a regular basis is not a wise thing. And Paul, writing to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uses the illustration of the children of Israel in, in the wilderness. And the word that's often used about them is murmuring. Now, murmur is onomatopoeia. That's a word describing its sound. So beep and honk and hiss and pop. These are words that are a, an approximation of the sound they make. And that's what murmur is. If you walk by a crowd of people who are complaining and negative, it sounds like murmur, 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 right? And, and so Paul says, 
using that illustration, do not complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples and were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. God has been so good to us, we really shouldn't be complaining. And when we complain, we dishearten people around us. Look for the bright side. Look for the positive. My grandfather was always a positive man. He died at 96, didn't have a wrinkle on his brow. And when he would greet you and you asked him, how are you doing? He had lots of problems and he could have complained. But instead he would say, lots to be thankful for. And when you left him, he would always say, well, we'll hope for the best. That was his positive outlook on life. And people were happy to be around him. People were attracted to him. Um, as I've said before, I'd hate to be the kind of person who brightens up a room by leaving it. You know, glad to see him go. He's a crepe hanger, always finding everything negative to talk about. So be positive, be thankful, and relinquish your right to complain. I don't have any right to complain after all God has done for me. Number seven, truth spoken in love is the greatest combination for edification. Right, speaking the truth in love causes us to grow up in all things into him who's the head Christ. So um, Christ was someone who when he spoke to you, you knew exactly what he was thinking because what came out of his mouth matched that. There was nothing surreptitious or sneaky about what he did. If people had a problem, he would confront them with it, but he always did it in a way that they knew he valued them. That's why prostitutes and tax collectors and all, you would think they'd be put off by his holiness, but they were drawn into the light by him because they knew that he valued them and he spoke truth to them, but in the process, he loved them. And that combination of speaking the truth in love is a winning combination to build up God's people. So Paul says to the Ephesians, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Uh, Paul talks about some people and, and he says that their word eats like a cancer. Wow. So we want things that build up, not tear down. Things that edify, not discourage and dishearten God's people. And the way to do that is to speak the truth in love. Number eight, practice daily encouragement of others. I quoted this verse very often. It spoke so clearly to me. Encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Now, sometimes Christians aren't fooled, aren't drawn into the deceitfulness of sin, but they're hardened by it. In other words, life gets so hard that they become hard in the process. And the way that we keep people from getting hard is by giving them words of encouragement. It'll keep us tender and thoughtful and kind to others. If we encourage other people, they in turn will keep from getting hard because of the deceitfulness of sin around them. This world is a hard place and the way we keep from being hard is by encouraging one another. Number nine, reverence is crucial in an increasingly secular age. I don't do it, but you know, you hear the comedians, you hear the news reporters, you listen to the politicians, and the world is becoming cruder. It's becoming harsher. People are more ready to say negative things and to criticize and to make jokes of people. And the scripture says, avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. And again, Paul says, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which is out of place. Instead, let there be thanksgiving. So there are out of bound territory 
to God's people and we shouldn't be involved in these things. Instead, we should be thankful. The scripture speaks about the sacrifice of praise. So it's easy enough to praise the Lord when things are going good, when everybody around you is also praising the Lord. But to praise the Lord in a hostile environment, to let people know that we trust the Lord, we value him, we appreciate what he's doing, is, it takes sacrifice. It's a costly thing. And when things are going hard in my life, things are tough to praise the Lord anyway. As, as Paul says, finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now that's halfway through his message. So it doesn't, he doesn't mean finally as in the sense this is my last point. He means finally when all is said and done, when your business has collapsed, when, when your health is gone, Find, uh, the bottom line is keep rejoicing in the Lord because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Lastly, number 10. Aren't we glad that most of life's big words are little ones? <laughs> you don't have to be a wordsmith to say the right things. Some people think you have to be eloquent and clever, but the most important words are, I love you, I'm sorry, that's okay, I forgive you, you're a blessing. Some people think rarity makes things more valuable, like diamonds, but actually water and air are both plentiful and precious. So we can sprinkle these little words on everything. Let your speech be always gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer every person. So the idea here is that you can serve up bland food, but a little salt on your potatoes, on your meat, it makes, makes it a little little tastier, a little more delicious. And so that's how it ought to be with our speech, that when we're speaking to people, you can get by with just the bare facts. But what a wonderful thing to say is, I thank the Lord for you, brother. God, God brought you to mind and I prayed for you today. We've known each other for 50 years and I, I only have happy memories. A little thing like that, they're all basically monosyllables. Through sprinkling a few words of grace on everything we say, by being gracious, seasoning our speech with salt, we know how we ought to answer every person. And God uses that to cause people to open up to what I have to say. When I speak about the Lord, they're more ready to listen to me because of the gracious speech that I have. So use these little words liberally. Sprinkle them everywhere on on people and let them know that you value them because God values them and use those little things to let everybody know how precious they are. We see little children doing this all the time. They draw a little picture with a rainbow and whatever and they write, I love you mommy. It means more than a million dollars. We should never grow out of that. Let's learn to sprinkle life with all those gracious words, those little words that means so much. John wrote his whole story of Christ and God's love in the vocabulary of an eight-year-old child, 700 words. And he uses words like life and love and light, simple concepts, but who would ever say they could get to the bottom of the Gospel of John? So here's a lovely example to us, a sprinkle life with words of grace, with kindly words, with thoughtful words. And if we do, we'll make life sweeter, more delicious for everyone around us.